truly, I have something entirely different to uh, share with you today. It is, uh, it's based on some work that I've done over a long period of time. This is just a subset of a series of pop, uh, of popular press articles I'm writing in a case study, also based on research of others and personal experience. So while these talk ta talks take many different forms, this one, instead of being about me, is really going to be about you. So what you'll see is I'm actually, this, this is a call to action, much like Rochelle's, but it's a call to action for leaders. Leaders, those of you that are leaders, the leaders where you work and the organizations you belong to. So let's start this off with, let's make it personal for you. So first, how many of you are students? And by the way, these lights really should be out there. Besides, the glare off my head is probably blinding. So, okay, so a lot of students. And then the rest of you working? Some of you, plenty of the students I know are working. Great. So in any case, I want to know, how many of you have witnessed unethical uh, behavior at school or work? Hands up. Take a look around. All right, great. Well, how many of you have been targets? Okay, how many of you aren't telling the truth? <laughs> Great, all right, I'll stop uh, shadowing the light, but that's pretty tough. So, in any case, a Harvard Business Review study uh, revealed that 98% of employees have reported in experiencing unethical behavior at work. So, I just trust that means that it's everywhere all of the time. And sadly, this trend is getting worse. The incidence has doubled since 1998 to 2011. So. Now, common forms of unethical behavior at work, there are a bunch. So, wherever I show when there's anything in yellow, those are questions for you to ponder. Don't have nearly enough time to solicit and share some of your answers, so you need to ask and answer these, ponder these yourselves. But that said, how many of you have been punished in a performance review? Nobody? Okay, so I'm the only one. Okay, great. So, had your reputation or opportunities undermined by coworkers or supervisors? All right, check. Okay, uh, yelled, or, yelled at or sworn at by your boss or coworkers? Boy, don't you people live charmed lives. Either that or you're just a little uneasy about sharing here. Okay, now forced to go along, shut up or else it's gonna cost you. Yeah, see, so this is a pervasive issue. This is why, this is the, this is the uh, business case for why what I'm going to talk about today matters. So, bullying is a particular one that's growing in incidents, certainly a form of unethical behavior. So, not just kid stuff anymore, not the older or bigger kid at school. In fact, <laughs> now that we're adults and at work, it's a lot worse. So, for example, how much worse? 27% of employees have uh, report being the direct, or direct targets of. 72% have witnessed it, and 72% of employers <laughs> either defend, somehow rationalize, or otherwise justify that sort of behavior. It's an epidemic. So why should leaders care? I can overwhelm you with a bunch of stats. These are some reasons why. Because add these all together, it affects performance. It affects performance in many ways. So if it affects your performance as an individual employee, that obviously affects the performance of your coworkers, your boss, your unit, your larger, larger organization. And again, if the incidence is so high, this is happening in many places every day. So that said, and by the way, so I'll compel to those of you that are in those leadership positions, formal ones, look, uh, CEOs or executives rather reported that they spend 15% of their time in a year dealing with unethical conduct. Translation, seven weeks. Holy cow, that's awful. So, what a drain. So now, importantly, is this sort of unethical behavior that I have described thus far, is it unethical? Yes, of course it is, by definition. But is it illegal? No. And that's a very important difference. The vast majority vast, vast majority of unethical conduct is legal. So, don't take my word for it. Let's look at Eric Holder, <laughs> the number one lawman in the land, well, formerly. So, he said, so related to the financial crisis. So, terrific quote. He says that while the conduct that led to the crisis 
could be, was indeed unethical and res, irresponsible. The fact is, is that some of the behavior even morally reprehensible. The fact of the matter is, the vast majority of it is not illegal, not criminal. You want some more stats? My last stat today. Only two dozen, less than two dozen. By the way, that's 24 out of 14,000 cases that were brought actually implicated the senior leadership of those organizations. Remember, I'm a business professor. I'm going to bring all sorts of work examples. So, okay. Uh, now, this is the topic of my talk. This is what I compel in my uh, call to action for you folks, is that legal versus ethical liability. It's a crisis of leadership and culture. And I'm going to focus on higher ed today, given the audience. So with that, I illustrate it this way. Make it a little lighter, but just as serious. So legal liability, yeah, that's a low hurdle. If that's your only standard, that's easy to cover. No problem. You can fall over that one and, and, and be happy about it. Whee! OK, so now, uh, when you start to contemplate the ethical liability, what is it? What's my role? That's much more challenging. And frankly, as this shows, many shy away from it. So now, from a leadership perspective, legal liability, I say, is a test of smarts. If you get into legal trouble, frankly, oftentimes, you blew it. Common sense to just, hey, that wasn't very smart. However, what is infinitely more important, I argue, is ethical liability. That's a test of character. Our leaders certainly need to be smart. But I think what also is relevant and that we expect from them today in all arenas, not just higher ed, certainly, is a test of character. We want character, leaders with character. So what's the most common form of unethical leadership? Without question, allowing unethical conduct to continue. Either not knowing, hey, I didn't know, therefore I'm not responsible. As a leader, you are. Or knowing and not acting. That's even worse. So, Unethical leadership breeds unethical cultures. The follow on from that, cultures are what perpetuate behavior. So if you have unethical leadership, unethical cultures reinforces unethical behavior. Now, college sports. <laughs> I don't really need to use anything else for uh, evidence for the case, but we're not going to go through these in, uh, in any real detail. But Symptomatic of the crisis, Penn State, Coach Sandusky, we all know of that one. Rutgers coach, Coach Rice, remember, throwing the basketballs, bullying, violence, etc. Ohio State, both Coach Trussell, the band director, blah, blah, blah. Florida State, they're countless, often involving local police. Amazing. Syracuse, hear that one recently. Bayheim, uh, North Carolina. Ten years of academic fraud. Ten years. SMU, sorry, Pony Express, right? We know that. Okay, so the problem though, those were problems each and every incident, but is that none were isolated incidents. These were patterns. Patterns are a real problem. So, and the fact that these were institutionalized because they were tolerated or condoned by leaders at all levels in these organizations. So, this is not a sports culture problem, however. I hear this in the news, the popular media is that, hey, we have a sports culture problem with sports. Hey, look, sports happen within the context of a larger university. So this is a higher ed culture problem, which means it's a leadership problem. And the fact that it's so pervasive and the costs are so great, that's what makes it a crisis. And this begs the question, well, why does this happen? Yeah, kind of funny, right? Hey, chuckle, chuckle. Yeah, business as usual, bad behavior, let's sweep it under the rug, under our culture rug that covers that all up until it grows into a big mound. Here's your leader just doing business as usual. La, 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 la. OK. Now, why? Leaders delegate ethics. They don't intervene when and where it happens. And what happens? It escalates. It becomes a pattern, becomes condoned, embedded. So now, again, another yellow question for you to ponder. How is knowing and doing nothing different, different from saying, hey, that's OK. Go ahead, bully. Go ahead, harass. Go ahead, be unfair. So I didn't know, or it's her, her, his responsibility in their area. Hey, if you're aware of it, you're responsible for it. So, particularly patterns. It's your job. I do a lot of leadership teaching work, leadership development consulting. Leadership 101, do not delegate ethics. Okay, so another cause. No consequences for the leaders. Are leaders above the law? Many times it seems so. So many examples. So Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan, one of the most highly revered people on Wall Street. 
Absolutely. He's still the CEO, still revered more every day. Got a pay raise last year. This is all despite what? JP Morgan paying over 20 billion, yeah, billion with a B, B billion dollars in legal settlements. All that happened on his watch, by the way. He didn't adopt any of that. It happened. He's responsible. Yet, what? He's still the revered man in that position. Jim Beheim. Yeah, so those of you that follow this, what? 10 years, 10 years of academic fraud. Well, yeah, and there are sanctions, absolutely, and they're appropriate, and some of them are pretty extreme, but yeah, he gets to stay in his job for three more years until his contract runs out. Please. Okay, Joe Paterno, Tom Ross, we know those. Hey, in my own department, hey, we have department chair, senior faculty members, deans, provosts, well aware of a pattern of bullying and unethical conduct, intimidation, retaliation, et cetera. Over four years, no consequences for any of them. So this is this condoned. So what ends up happening, it gets embedded in the culture. And it signals that unethical behavior, if it's not actually expected, that it's OK so long as you're protected, you're revered, or you're otherwise in power. So why no consequences for leaders? We can speculate. These are some good reasons. One, the halo of reputations. This is a big one. Years of service. You've been doing that job for 10 years, 20, 30, 40. Hey, there's no problem. Oh, hey, look, I know him. I know her. She's great. She would never do that. Well, look, people have said that about Paterno and all the other people I've listed, yet that happened. All of these things happened. Performance metrics. Hey, what do we measure? We measure what we get. Profits, wins, championships, rankings, donations, centers, blah, 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 all those things. I don't know of one single organization that directly measures ethical behavior. You think, yeah, unethical, sure, if it torpedoes, but ethical conduct. Hubris, of course. That's the constant challenge for leaders everywhere, is that, hey, rules apply to others, but not to me, or the willingness to admit, confront their mistakes. And then what I refer to as the BBTL syndrome. You've been the boss too long. So many in the organizations you work for, look, how long have the presidents been the presidents? Here, deans, deans, coaches, coaches, oftentimes for decades. When was the last time they were the target of unethical conduct? So as a result, it's abstract to them. It's something they, they need to manage, not something they actually experience. So, and I ask you again, a yellow question here. What about the leaders where you work? Is there a consequence to BBTL? So now leaders foster unethical cultures. So famous Texas senator, Sam Rayburn, hey, if you want to get along, go along. This phrase is a hallmark of unethical cultures. People don't speak up, and those that do, they're punished or otherwise <laughs> suffer some of the consequence. Perhaps they're bullied. The cult what about the culture where you work? How many of you have a go along to get along culture where you work? Yeah, you're just bashful and shy. That's all right. That's why I'm up here. I'm going to say the tough things today. All right, so antidotes. And I'll wrap this up because I'm running over. I'm going to get the hook. So um, would you tolerate bullying of a customer or a student? No, you wouldn't where you work. You wouldn't. So why do you tolerate that sort of conduct or treatment of employees? Codes of ethics, they're just empty words unless leaders actually walk the talk. They're responsible. Just empty words unless they comply themselves. Modeling matters. So have some of these terrific quotes. Look, and one of these people is one of the most powerful people in a university. The other one, hey, has experienced the, uh, has received the greatest raises of anybody in the university. It's been recently promoted to department chair. Hey, if we're not careful, watch out. Be a dean or a provost or president someday. So accountability. Look, there needs to be accountability. Not just, oh, hey, the coaches, just in the athletics department. Look, that needs to go up the chain because they're also responsible. So communicate compliance and non-compliance. Celebrate the people that have made the tough call, that have made the tough choice, that have done the tough thing. And don't hide or sweep under the rug people that have not. Now, two closing slides. This one, remember, legal does not mean ethical. So this is my call to action. Clearing this hurdle, the ethical liability hurdle, that's what builds your leadership, your character, as well as the character and quality of your organizations. And I leave with these parting shots. Ponder these. This is your to-do list. And thank you very much.